perhaps a moment long overdue as the San Francisco 49ers dominated the Seattle Seahawks on Sunday, but there were some mixed emotions after this one because the 49ers lost their starting quarterback for the season. A lot of frustration, anger, and hurt, and those feelings are absolutely valid. Questions about Shanahan's play calling and use of personnel, and we're going to take a look at that. In fact, let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it and take a look at the film. Now, I'm going to focus solely for the first 10 or 15 minutes of this video on the plays that Trey Lance ran on the field because this is the last time we're going to see him until next year, and 49er fans want to know where is he at in terms of his development. Let's take a look. On this first play we're going to look at, Seattle sends a blitz. Five men are going to rush the passer. And probably not to anyone's surprise if they know Pete Carroll. He likes to test young quarterbacks early. Up top, we see the corners are giving the receivers a lot of space. Because Seattle is sending a blitz, there's only one safety on the field now, and he's on the other side of the formation. Brandon Ayuk takes the space the defense left behind. Now Josh Jones, in fact, gave Brandon Ayuk so much space that now he's in the position of having to make a difficult open field tackle. And Brandon Ayuk just goes right around him. Trey Lance is still dropping that ball down quite a bit on his delivery. And again, this is not something that has concerned me as much as it concerns some other people. We've talked about it on this channel before. There's been plenty of quarterbacks with kind of a low delivery like that. You can think of Randall Cunningham, for example. And to me, it's a little bit like trying to change a batter's swing. Sometimes it's better if you just don't mess with it. Trey has to throw the ball the way he's comfortable doing it. And as long as it doesn't lead to turnovers, I don't think it's a problem. On this next play, San Francisco starts off with Kyle Juszczyk lined up in the slot. They also bring Charlie Warner around to block for Ty Davis Price. Naturally, the Seattle linebackers pursue hard to the football. With number 56, Jordan Brooks, in particular, over pursuing on this play. Brooks had a tough game, as we'll see as we go on. Ty Davis Price makes a nice cutback. He's able to do this because the linebacker, number 10, Yes, they can wear that number now. Nuosu stays home on the play. And this is exactly what Pete Carroll wants him to be doing. Nuosu had an excellent game for the Seahawks. Here, the entire 49er offensive line moves to their right. And you can see Trey Lance showing the ball on the play action fake. Quarterbacks do this to influence the linebackers. Once again, Jordan Brooks gets mesmerized staring at that football and Kyle Juszczyk runs right by him and is wide open. But check out Nuosu again, not biting on the play action fake and over pursuing to where he thinks that ball is going to go. Instead, he stays home and heads straight for the quarterback and impacts the play. He's toast. Trey Lance has no choice but to throw that ball away. Now, it was really important for me to show you guys that play because I saw a lot of comments this week and last week saying, why didn't we call more rollouts for the quarterback? And just like last week, the defense was prepared for it. Calling a rollout for Trey Lance is, quite frankly, a good idea. And so defensive coordinators know they need to be prepared for that play, and they were. So now it's third down and the Seattle defense hangs back a little bit. The 49ers put Debo Samuel in motion and watch how it affects the linebackers just a little bit. Next, the Niners take rookie right guard Spencer Burford and pull him around to the other side. Trey Lance will follow behind him. At first glance, it looks like Jordan Brooks might have a shot at making this play, but Ross Dwelly takes care of him easily enough. 
and with his legs, Trey Lance picks up the first down. On this play, the blocking is outstanding. TDP has a big hole to run through, and Quandre Diggs is in the awkward position of having to make an open field tackle, which he misses. So far, this drive has been too easy for the 49ers. But here things go awry a little bit. When Brandon Ayuk goes in motion, the corner steps right up to the line of scrimmage. Here Trey Lance could have called a blocking audible. But in the end, he chose not to go that route. Now look, we're not in the meeting room, so I can't say I know for sure exactly what play was supposed to be run here. It looks like Spencer Burford is going to pin his man to the inside, McGlinchey will block the man in front of him, and TDP will run through the hole. Instead, McGlinchey blocks the corner, and there's absolutely nobody to block the linebacker, Daryl Johnson, who has a straight shot at the backfield and makes the tackle easily. Let me know in the comments what you guys think happened on this play. Naturally, Shanahan is eager to get some of that yardage back. At the snap, we can see that although the 49ers had Jeff Wilson Jr. in the backfield, he's clearly going to be running a route here. And what else does the defense see? High hats, right? The 49ers' offensive line is getting ready to pass protect. Trey is clearly going back to throw a pass, and the linebackers say, uh-oh, we better get back into... <laughs> pass defense. And that's unfortunate because this isn't a passing play. It's a run. So now it's third and goal. Big play, right? Seattle handles this by sending, in addition to their four-man rush, a blitz. And Trey Lance does the perfect thing here. He gets ready to throw right into the blitz. But when a man comes from that side of the field, that's usually where a weakness is in the defense. It makes sense, right? Jeff Wilson Jr. gives his man a move to the outside. He has to respect that. And when he does, he cuts back to the inside, and Trey gets him the football. And this brings up a fourth and goal at the two. Now, what should the 49ers do here? You might be tempted to take the points early. And if they were on the road, that's probably what I would do. But you know what? You're playing at home. In fact, it's your home opener. You got to go for it here. You've got a young quarterback. You want to set that tone right away. For those of you who are into the analytics, the analytics say you should definitely go for it in this situation. It increases your win probability. And if I haven't mentioned it before, special thanks to Ben Baldwin for making that information publicly available. I'll put the link in the description. In any event, Shanahan decides to kick the field goal, and Robbie Gold knocks it through, making the score 3 to nothing. Let's go to the 49ers' next possession. Lance has been running the ball well and making good decisions, so here Shanahan calls a read option, a play 49er fans know well. Lance reads the end. The end stays home, so he hands the football to the running back. Next play. Shanahan calls another read option, this time to Debo Samuel. 
The end stays home, so Lance should not hand this ball to Debo, who would run right into a tackle. And here Lance makes a mistake and hands the ball to Debo, who appears to be caught dead to rights in the backfield. But sometimes mistakes are just happy accidents. And before you know it, Debo is being chased by nine Seattle Seahawks. It's a 51-yard gain for the 49ers. From this angle, we get a chance to see what a special athlete Debo Samuel is. So far, the Niners are rolling, and Shanahan wants to keep it going. He calls another read option. Nwosu stays home. So Trey Lance will follow the block of Trent Williams. Who better to block for you on a run, right? And unfortunately, this is where it all comes crashing down. We can see that that ankle is facing the wrong direction. Now, when I was watching this live, it didn't look like that hard of a hit. I thought, well, I must have just missed it. And I expected to see Lance get absolutely blasted on this replay or some kind of cheap shot by a Seattle defender, but no. It looks like the ankle just got underneath him kind of awkwardly here. Kind of a freak accident. But it does bring up the question, why would Shanahan call that run there? Is that an inappropriate time and place to call that run? Is it an inappropriate player to call that run with? Your star quarterback who you gotta protect, right? Let's take a look at a couple of situations where quarterbacks have run that play. The first one from this year, actually on the same day, Lamar Jackson against the Miami Dolphins. And this next one from 27 years ago, Steve Young against the Dallas Cowboys. So teams will run their quarterback and they will run them violently up the middle. But there are some important differences here. The first of which is Trey Lance is not built like Lamar Jackson or Cam Newton or some of these other quarterbacks that were able to have these physical kind of careers, albeit shorter ones in the case of Cam Newton. I understand that Lance was great at those runs at North Dakota State, but the 49ers gave up so much to get him and we've waited so long for this moment it might have made more sense to take a little bit better care of him and not subject him to those kind of hits. It's possible that this was a misuse of personnel. Now let's talk about the second key difference, which is on those plays I've just shown you, those teams were at the goal line. The reward in the risk reward evaluation was a lot higher, right? They stood to gain a touchdown. Here it's second down and eight and Shanahan calls this play. I, I just don't know if the risk was worth the potential reward of a gain of few yards. Now, something the 49ers may not have considered is the possibility that he would be out for the entire season, right? I mean, typically, if he were to take a brutal shot, maybe, at worst, maybe he would be out a couple of weeks. Jimmy Garoppolo could fill in. That was the whole idea, right? And then it wouldn't be a problem. But... I don't think they took into account the worst case scenario, which is Lance missing the entire season. And that's a really bad scenario in this case because he was the backup all year last year. At North Dakota State, they sat out the year before due to the pandemic. And before that, he only played one year of college ball. So we're talking about a situation where a guy, talented as he may be, will have one year of college ball, a year where he didn't play at all, Another year where he was the backup, and then a third year where he was out due to injury. Three straight years of very little football being played with only a year behind that as his foundation. That is not a good situation and potentially sets his development and the future of the franchise. I don't want to make it sound drastic, but it sets it back a couple of years at least. Now he's going to be another year behind, so to speak. That's something the 49ers, I don't think, factored in. Now, why did Shanahan call that play? I'm going to show you one more run, again by Lamar Jackson. Check this out.
read option, and Lamar Jackson explodes for like a 70 some odd yard run. It's ridiculous. That is what Shanahan is so tempted by. And let's face it, the offense was rolling against Seattle. It was rolling. I can understand why he called the play. I don't know if it was the best judgment. Is it fair to criticize Shanahan? Mm, that's a tough call. I know that emotions are running high right now, and rightfully so. But at the end of the day, Shanahan was calling what he thought would work best for his team. And unfortunately, in this case, there were some really bad consequences. Fortunately for the 49ers, they have a starting caliber quarterback. I'm not saying where he ranks among starting quarterbacks, but a starting caliber quarterback as their backup. And right into the game comes Jimmy Garoppolo. It's third down and Pete Carroll immediately calls for a very aggressive six-man blitz while the rest of the team hangs back. Garoppolo immediately sees where one of the blitzers is coming from and takes the easy read to Brandon Ayuk. Even though this pass was completed, the blitz was nevertheless a success for Seattle. They were able to stop Ayuk before he got the first down, and because they blitzed from both sides of the formation, Garoppolo never had a chance to see the other side of the field, in which Jeff Wilson Jr. could have had a touchdown. Nuosu absolutely blasts Garoppolo here. Watch as Jimmy stands in and takes the hit and delivers the football. Very impressive. Now, it brings up another fourth and two. Once again, the 49ers are faced with a decision. Should they go for it or should they kick the field goal? Now, here we're one play removed from the starting quarterback getting badly injured and your backup having to come in on short notice without preparation and go right into the game. I can understand here why Shanahan may have wanted to be a little bit more conservative and take the field goal. And Gold knocks it through, making the score 6 to nothing. Let's go to the 49ers' next possession, because Seattle was doing absolutely nothing on offense all day long. What do you need to throw the ball deep? Time. Now let's take a look at the stem of the route of Ray Ray McLeod, because he's going deep. At least, that's as far as Tariq Woolen, the Seahawks' rookie cornerback, knows. And he does the right thing here. He turns his hips, and he heads back in that direction to cover that play to make sure he doesn't give up a touchdown. When he does, he cuts to the outside, and Garoppolo throws a nice ball way across from the far hash mark outside the numbers to get him the football. The Seahawks aren't going to let any quarterback just sit back there and carve him up like that. So here, in addition to their four-man rush, Seattle sends a blitz. The 49ers put Debo Samuel in motion to that side. So Cody Barton runs over to pick him up. Now, maybe he thought Ross Dwelly was just going to throw a block here. Nope, he's going out for a pass, and he comes wide open on the play. And Garoppolo throws a deep pass outside the numbers, way down the field. And Dwelly takes it all the way in for the touchdown. Garoppolo's surgically repaired shoulder looks great. In fact, it looks like he has a little bit of arm strength that he didn't have last season when he was dealing with that injury. Now watch as they bring Debo Samuel in motion, how it affects the linebackers. Remember, it's so hard to defend this offense. Here Quandre Diggs comes over, and he was left trying to clean up messes on the back end all game long. Gold knocks through the extra point, and the 49ers go up 13 to nothing. I mentioned that the Seattle offense wasn't doing anything all game long, so let's take a look at some of the tricks the 49ers were using on defense. It looks like they're starting off with two safeties perhaps, but no, the 49ers send Dre Greenlaw on a blitz, and Talanoa Hafunga will pick up Tyler Lockett. Notice Fred Warner is also lined up at the line of scrimmage. 
But this is just a five-man blitz because Nick Bosa, yes, Nick Bosa, is going to drop back into pass coverage. And it turns out the 49ers aren't done there. Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw are just faking the blitz. Then they drop back into pass coverage themselves. Let's take a look and see how all this nonsense unfolds. Now Warner and Greenlaw don't exactly appear to be well coordinated here. I'm wondering if there was perhaps some confusion. In any event, they do clog up the middle of the field, but Hassan Ridgeway gets a great push here and there's not really a great place for Geno Smith to go with the football. He tries the one-on-one -on -one matchup of Tyler Lockett against Talanoa Hafunga. And just like in week one, Hafunga made plays all day in week two. Hafunga knocks it up in the air and it's intercepted by Tayshawn Gibson who almost had one in week one against the Bears. 49er football. Two plays later, the 49ers are facing a third down. Kyle Juszczyk occupies the linebacker and Juwan Jennings occupies the safety giving Brandon Ayuk a one-on-one -on -one shot. What do you need to throw the ball deep? Time, but it looks like Nwosu has an inside shot at Garoppolo, but Trent Williams just easily corrals him to the inside, and Garoppolo just slides to his left, and notice he throws the football to the outside, away from the defender, where only Brandon Ayuk can get it. This is a great throw. I saw someone online say that they thought Garoppolo was throwing Ayuk open here, and I would agree with that statement. And Ayuk just misses out on making that catch. It would have been a really tough one. The play is unsuccessful, but I for one absolutely love that the 49ers are taking a lot more of these deep shots this year. Ooh, so close, so close. So that brings up fourth down, and if Kyle Shanahan didn't go for it on fourth and two, twice, surely he wouldn't go for it on fourth and nine, right? Well, this is a bit of a unique situation. As you can see, the ball's on the 39-yard line. It's too far away for a field goal, but too close to punt. So the 49ers just decide it's not going to make much of a difference either way. Let's just try to go for it and try to get the first down. Now, if Garoppolo had been looking Jeff Wilson Jr.'s way, he might have had the first down here. The closest defender to him is Cody Barton, and as you can see, he's facing the wrong way. But Jimmy, understandably so, can't resist another one-on-one -on -one shot, this time to the speedster Danny Gray. A couple of things, because I just said I like that the 49ers are taking all these deep shots, right? So what's different about this play? Well, one thing is it's fourth down. You know, on second down or third down, if you take the deep shot and you miss, you have another down to fall back on. On fourth down, you don't have that. And deep passes, regardless of who is throwing the football, are low percentage plays. It may have been more pragmatic to try to pick up the first down here, but Garoppolo goes for the touchdown and they just miss out on connecting. Quandre Diggs wanted that interception, but it's a good thing he didn't get it because... He would be down there in the end zone and the Seahawks would get the ball at the 20-yard line. But a turnover on downs, on the other hand, puts the ball at the 39-yard line, which is where they got the football. But after a couple of negative plays, now it's the Seahawks that are facing a third and long. Geno has the underneath man if he wants him, but he's nowhere near the line to gain. That's not an option. Maybe he can throw the ball to the outside, but that's a long pass to the far side of the field outside the numbers. I think the defense gets there. So he decides to take the shot to DK Metcalf. Emmanuel Mosley played great, and here he tips the ball up, and it's intercepted by Fred Warner. We see the flag come out there. The officials ruled that Mosley interfered with DK on the play. Well, let's take another look. Now, there is some contact, but you're allowed to play through a player if you're going for the football. 
And I think that is a very tough call on the 49ers. In fact, I disagree with it. Here the 49ers send Charvarius Ward on what was possibly a run blitz. Notice the Seahawks are in an I formation. But this turns out to be a pass, and that puts Fred Warner in the difficult position of having to defend Tyler Lockett. And as good as Fred Warner is, him defending Tyler Lockett is a mismatch in Seattle's favor. I stopped it here because there's a few more things to take a look at. DK Metcalf is going deep, and the safety rightfully runs over to cover that play. Now let's take a look back at Geno Smith because the Blitz did successfully collapse the pocket, and now he has to scramble. What do you do when you see your quarterback scrambling? You run towards him. And Fred Warner loses his sense of where Tyler Lockett is, and Lockett comes wide open here. And Geno finds Lockett for a 27-yard gain. This would be Seattle's biggest play of the ball game. But remember before when I said I disagreed with the officials' ruling of pass interference? Well, the ball never lies. It's the read option. Nick Bosa stays home, so Gino correctly hands the ball off to little used running back DJ Dallas. And up top, check out the blocking of wide receiver DK Metcalf. You have to be able to block as a wide receiver in the NFL. Oh, those tricky Seahawks. Metcalf is going out for a pass. There's a couple of problems with this. For one thing, you've got to get this ball way to the outside and to the back, away from the defender, right? And I know it looks like a short, or at least shorter distance, but that's a tough throw, especially for someone who's not a quarterback like DJ Dallas. And look at his footwork. Now, I may be nitpicking a little bit here. I understand he's just a running back and those guys never set their feet on this kind of play, but the ball comes up laughably short here and it's easily intercepted by Charvarius Ward. A big play for the 49ers defense, but a huge miscue for the Seattle Seahawks. Now, kind of similar to the Quandre Diggs play, I wish Charvarius Ward would have gone down in the end zone here because then the ball would have come out to the 20. Instead, he tries to run it out, and he gets tackled about the six or seven yard line. So the 49er offense has to start out backed up. They do gain some yardage, but they end up having to punt the football. Now, I want you to notice the defenders on the gunners, there's only one apiece. The Seahawks might be trying to put a block on here. This allows Tarverius Moore to go right by, and this is important, as we'll see. Okay, there's the fair catch. Now, you're not allowed to touch him. We all know the rule. But there's no rule against his own teammate touching him. So watch as Tarverius Moore blocks his man into the punt returner, causing a muffed punt. One more thing. Look at how high up in the air the football is. This play is only possible because of a big kick with lots of hang time by the 49ers punter Mitch Wisnowski, who they recently just gave a big money extension to, and here we can see why. Now, if they were going for a block, that was a pretty lackluster attempt. Not exactly sure what the Seahawks were doing here on special teams. It's worth noting that the Seahawks lost their special teams coordinator last year after he was hired by San Francisco. So now the 49ers are threatening to score again. They line Jeff Wilson Jr. up as a wide receiver all the way to the outside. Cody Barton runs over to cover him, and he's got to be conscious of the fact that Wilson does have some speed. And Wilson Jr. takes off like he's going for the end zone. Again, the importance of the stem of the route, right? So Barton naturally does the right thing. He gets back and makes sure he doesn't give up the touchdown. And when he does... Wilson Jr. just turns around and catches a pass.
and it's another nice throw by Jimmy. Now, I did see some fans asking, why didn't Shanahan call all these passes when Trey Lance was in the game? Well, the truth is, these passes were part of the game plan that was already in place for Trey Lance. They just hadn't gotten to him all yet. And it's the handoff right to the fullback, and they seem to catch Seattle just a little bit flat-footed here, and Juszczyk powers his way into the end zone for a touchdown. And the 49ers go up 20 to nothing at the half. Okay, let's move ahead to the first play of the third quarter. The Seahawks start with a fake handoff. Rookie right tackle Abraham Lucas will block down to the inside to help sell the fake. The Hawks will block Nick Bosa with Rashad Penny. And DK Metcalf will take the space the defense left behind. And then Nick Bosa says, you're going to try to block me with a running back? Are you kidding me? Now here you can see Geno Smith holding his head, and that was a very hard hit. Let's go back to the snap. He gets slung down and his head hits the ground pretty hard. Now remarkably, the officials in this situation are supposed to require the player to go get checked out in the blue tent, make sure they're okay. But maybe the official didn't have a clear view of the play. Later in the third quarter, we see Brandon Ayuk has not made his break yet, but Garoppolo has already started his throwing motion. This is great timing and anticipation by Garoppolo, and watch as he gets this ball over the outstretched arms of the linebacker. That is a great throw. This run fake to Debo Samuel has to be respected. Watch as it moves Jordan Brooks and helps give Garoppolo that little bit of extra space needed to get that ball up and over him. He's not always perfect, but that was a good one. Incidentally, that was a play that built off of a lot of those earlier options by Trey Lance holding the ball for Debo, and then instead of handing it to him and instead of taking off running, that's a play where Trey Lance could have thrown that football. Instead, it happened to be Jimmy Garoppolo. Later in the drive, Jeff Wilson Jr. breaks off a nice gain. Let's go back and take a look at how that play works. The 49ers start by putting Debo Samuel in motion. He's such a threat, the linebackers for the Seahawks naturally go with him. And the 49ers offensive line goes in the opposite direction. In fact, because they're running in the opposite direction, they don't even need to worry about blocking Daryl Taylor. The end result is five offensive linemen blocking three defensive linemen. In fact, it's so OP, Aaron Banks is able to peel off the nose tackle Al Woods and head upfield and pick up poor Jordan Brooks. And there's Quandre Diggs to clean it up again. Long day at the office for him. The drive stalls at the two-yard line. Now, what do you think Shanahan decided to do on fourth and two? <laughs> I say that sarcastically, but in reality, all these field goals do add up. I mean, those are real points that go on the board and continue to put the Seahawks in a deeper and deeper hole. Here we're going to take a look at something we analyzed during the Green Bay Packers game in the playoffs last year. Because Ross Dwelly has a tough assignment. He has to block the man in front of him and stick out his arm and slow down Tariq Woolen coming off the edge. But I want you to watch the center snap the ball here. We're just going to go a few frames. Okay, now take a look at Tariq Woolen. Maybe there was an advantage for Seattle for having their special teams coach go to San Francisco because they knew what that snap count was going to be. Woolen, along with the entire Seahawks special teams unit, 
gets a great jump off the ball, while all the 49ers, including Ross Dwelly, are still in their stance. Dwelly had no chance to slow Woolen down here. He blocks the kick. Michael Jackson picks it up and takes it all the way back for a Seahawks touchdown. Now that is a play that very easily could have been the turning point in the game. And in years past, that's probably how it would have gone down, right? Seattle sucks in the first half. In the second half, they kind of get things going. They stay in it. They get a big play like that, an unusual play that gives them the edge. That wouldn't happen in this game. In fact, these would be Seattle's only points of the entire game. The 49ers defense basically pitched a shutout. All right, let's skip ahead to the fourth quarter. This is the 49ers last drive of the game. There's seven minutes left and it's technically a two score game, 20 to seven. So the Seahawks cook up something here to try to confuse Jimmy Garoppolo. Let's take a look and see what they had in mind. The first thing they notice is the 49ers have Debo Samuel lined up in the backfield. Now they're gonna rush these three linemen and also send Cody Barton. On the other side, Nuosu, who's had a great game, is going to fake like he's rushing and then drop back to take away Garoppolo's favorite pass, the one right over the middle. You know which one, the one he always throws in these big situations. And it almost worked. Garoppolo has cocked his arm, getting ready to throw this football. And Pete Carroll almost got one over on Jimmy. But when Garoppolo's on, he's on. He was crisp in this game. He missed a few throws, but this time he sees what the Seahawks are up to. Where else can he go with the football? Third down monster Jawan Jennings is being bracketed. But somehow in all of this, the Seahawks forgot to account for, or maybe they just took the risk of Debo Samuel coming out of the backfield on a pass route. Garoppolo spots him and gets him the football. Huge first down for the 49ers. Here we get a great angle of Garoppolo seeing it at the last second and then just calmly moving on to his next read. When it's late and you're tired, that's when it's the most important time to focus. But here we see Daryl Taylor is laughably offsides. In fact, some of the players for the 49ers and the Seahawks are just kind of standing around because they thought the officials might whistle this play dead. But nope, the officials let the play play out, so to speak. That means Garoppolo has a free play. The read is obvious. Take the one-on-one -on -one shot to Brandon Ayuk in the end zone. The defender is beaten, so he just mugs Brandon Ayuk, and the flag comes out for pass interference. Ball will be placed at the one-yard line. Now, there's only two plays left to analyze here, but again, I'm going to question Shanahan's judgment just a little bit. You've lost your starting quarterback for the season. Thank God you have an outstanding, excellent backup quarterback. Are you really going to risk him too by calling a read option at the goal line in a game you already have won? And the answer is yes. That's exactly what Shanahan calls. The end stays home, so Garoppolo keeps the football and Dwelly runs some interference while Garoppolo gets north and south and takes it to just, just inches outside of that goal line. Garoppolo is undefeated with the quarterback sneak, and he punches it in, making the final score 27-7 to in a game that very easily could have been 30 to zero. A total domination of the Seattle Seahawks. Well, I figured I would wear my Trey Lance jersey 
for the last time this season. I do believe he will be back next year as the starting quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Jimmy Garoppolo will be a free agent at the end of the season, and he will command maximum dollars from the market. The 49ers aren't interested in paying that much for a quarterback. They've made that very clear. They were tough on him in the negotiations this year, forcing him to take a pay cut, right? And furthermore, unless he massively outperforms uh, compared to what we've seen in the past, I think the interest in the organization would be to move on. Now, if he does outperform, if he goes to a Super Bowl, if he wins MVP, I mean, something crazy like that, of course, all bets are off. Look, this is the NFL. Anything can happen. We know that by now. Realistically, the 49ers are going to allow him to move on in free agency and get back the third round compensatory pick, right? That was one of the reasons it was so attractive to bring him back for another season, even if he was just the backup. What about Trey Lance? What does his future hold? Well, he'll recover from the ankle injury. He'll do the rehab. Yes, his development is set back another year. I think it's going to be important for Kyle Shanahan to protect him a little bit more next season. He can't afford another setback. He really can't. And it's going to be obvious the 49ers won't have Jimmy Garoppolo as the backup quarterback again next year. So he will not have the luxury of running Trey Lance as much as he did this year. Now, all the questions are going to be about should Shanahan have done that? You know, was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? I understand why Shanahan did it. We took a look at some film. We can see why it's such an attractive option. It's hard for defenses to defend. Ultimately, Trey's not quite built in the way that maybe Shanahan was secretly hoping for, right? We talked about it last year. When Trey runs, he really runs looking to throw the ball downfield. They did do some quarterback power at North Dakota State, but we know that those opponents aren't NFL caliber. Now, that's not a knock on them personally. I'm not, I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is in the NFL, it's a very serious game. You're playing with grown men, and you can get hurt. And that kind of play call with Trey Lance's physique probably is going to be no longer appropriate moving forward, especially if you're trying to protect him. There will be an all-out effort to get Trey ready and develop him as a pocket passer who has that ability to scramble and extend plays like Russell Wilson. You know, think about it. In Russell Wilson's early career, we didn't really see him take off and run a whole lot. He would run for seven yards to pick up a first down, or he would take what the defense gave him. But there was not a lot of Cam Newton-type designed runs because... Wilson's a smaller guy, right? It wouldn't make sense. Instead, he would extend the play and then find somebody down the field on a broken coverage. That, I believe, is going to be Trey Lance's strength. What else? He needs the reps. There was a lot of discussion last year about whether Trey should start or whether he should sit. Ultimately, we kind of found out after the fact he was dealing with a lot of injuries. It made more sense to sit him. Is he a better quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo as of today? No. And I know some people might be all up in arms about that, but before you run to the comments, hear my heart here, because I'm on record as saying Lance should be the starter. The reason I think he needs to be the starter is because he has sat for so long. He desperately needs in-game reps. He needs experience. It's a tricky situation the 49ers are in when you have a quarterback like Jimmy Garoppolo who is very capable but does have some limitations. We talked about his downfield throwing ability. Sometimes he'll throw that kind of wild out of nowhere interception, right? The 49ers are trying to move away from that and move towards a quarterback with a more complete skill set. But that skill set has to be developed. And I think it's okay to say that. I don't think we're saying anything wrong there 
What I have heard from some of the fans is Trey needs reps and he will win us a Super Bowl this year. Those two sentences do not agree with each other. If he's not fully developed, if he's not fully ready to go, he's not going to be in a position to win a Super Bowl, especially in the playoffs and those extremely intense clutch situations. You think about the other quarterbacks who are really starting to come into their own right now, Jalen Hurts, uh, Tua Tagovailoa, right? They had phenomenal games on Sunday, but think about where they were last year. You know, these are guys that have improved incrementally over the years and turned into that professional quarterback that can really deliver and, and you know, when it's all on the line, their money, right? This is what they're turning into. Trey Lance is years behind those guys and now he's going to be a couple years behind even guys like mac jones and justin fields i believe he could go toe to toe with those guys they're not as talented as hertz or tug of Iowa, in my opinion but it's going to take time it will take time fans should not expect instant results um and ultimately it's just very unfortunate what happened today I don't see any other way out of this other than to just move forward and move on. That's all we can do. We can't get rid of the coach or anything like that. For one thing, the owner just gave him a, a big extension, so he would be paying Shanahan for years. And then you're trying to find another coach. It's probably not going to be as good. There's a lot about that plan that doesn't seem to make any sense over an unfortunate mistake that he made. Let's be honest. It was a mistake. I hope that play comes out of future game plans that's all i can say about that i think we've talked enough about the whole dream jimmy trey situation let's talk about the defense a little bit nick bosa had a big sack talanoa hafunga was money again all over the field he deflected that pass that was intercepted by gibson charvarius ward had another great interception out of that bizarre seahawks pistol t formation someone will know in the comments uh a disaster play for seattle something uncharacteristic of pete carroll maybe and something i bet they pull out of their playbook too right but the defense was great they pitched a shutout like i said the score should have been 30 to 0 and they played pretty good in the first half of last week before things kind of went haywire in the second half so where do the 49ers go from here well they have a game against Denver. They have two altitude games this season, the first of which is next week's Sunday night football in Denver. The next one will be at Mexico City. So we're going to see what kind of conditioning these guys have in them. Denver's a tough place to play. Fortunately, they're absolutely terrible. We all saw their head coach make the nonsensical decision to run a solid 60 seconds off the clock and then attempt a 64 yard field goal that failed and the following week against houston they struggled mightily too it's all going to come down to can the 49ers keep russell wilson in check and i think they can wilson is not the same player he was he's older he's slower he's not done taking any steps that, that i can see to lose any of the weight he's put on and the 49er defense is going to be up to the challenge. By now, they've had several years experience playing mobile quarterbacks, playing against Russell Wilson twice a year. They're going to be just fine. Well, that'll do it for this week. I want to thank all my new subscribers, and I especially want to thank a couple of people uh, for their just outstanding generosity. I've been so humbled and honored by you guys. Leave me a comment. I read every comment, and I I'm just absolutely thrilled to be doing this week after week next week it's sunday night football for the 49ers the whole nation's going to get to see this team and what they can become you know the, the 49ers as a squad have they put it all together yet it seems like they've they've really gotten close but maybe they haven't quite gelled completely what a thrill that would be if we can see them put together a, a really complete game on sunday night where they're just hitting on all cylinders I know I would love to see it. So we're going to break down that game next week, and I will see you guys then.